In the Gospel reading today, our Lord tells us that we are going to be sorrowful while the world rejoices. This is something that is coming upon us, and rather quickly, as citizens of this unfortunate state. We look at what just happened this last week. Thankfully, they were able at least to remove the one piece of legislation that would have made pedophiles a protected class in the state of Minnesota. But Walls signed into legislation or into law a couple of other pieces of legislation this week. First of all, it makes Minnesota a sanctuary state for abortion. And it makes Minnesota a sanctuary state for those seeking sex change operations. How despicable. And as disgusting as that is, next week we're going to get even more. We are going to have in the state of Minnesota, I don't know what they're calling it, I would call it the thought police. It will be, it's already made it through the House, it's going to make it through the Senate next week, and I'm sure our unfortunate governor will be signing it. And what that will do is set up a database and also a tip line, a hotline, for anyone to call about anyone who says or does something contrary to what they would want said or done. I'm going to make sure that I give them lots of reasons to make sure my name is toward the top of the list. But that's beside the point. We have to speak the truth even though they don't want it. And I say all of this to simply say we must recognize that we are in this together. And by that, I don't just mean you and me. I mean anyone who seeks the truth. So when St. Peter told us in the, fir- in the first reading today that we have to honor all men and love the brotherhood, we have to be able to respect people, and we have to be able to recognize the unity that is there. And what the devil is doing is in every way possible, he is trying to cause division. And we have to fight that. We know what we've talked about with the politicians, they're trying everything to divide us along racial lines, along religious lines, whatever lines they can. We know the FBI is trying to infiltrate the churches and so on. We know all of that. And that's one thing when it's coming from the outside. But there is division coming from the inside. And that's what I want to deal with today because this is very, very troubling to me. And we are getting lots and lots of phone calls at the parish. So many that we actually had to put a cheat sheet together for the secretary to deal with it when people call. Because the simple question that people are asking is, is the Novus Ordo Mass invalid? Because that's what I'm being told. Then I went to somebody's house this week after helping the secretary put her cheat sheet together. And the person looked at me and said, what's going on? I said, with what? He said, I'm getting all these phone calls from people asking me if the Novus Ordo Mass is valid. She said, because they're being told by people that it's invalid. So I want to address that today. And I want to address what follows from it because we need to recognize the consequences. So first of all, there's the point of being able to say we have to respect people with where they're at. And we need to be able to strive for unity. But the question now that we have to start with is the one that's brought up. Is the Mass valid? So what do we need to have a valid Mass? First of all, you have to have bread and wine. The bread has to be made from wheat, flour, and water only. In other words, you can't have rice cake, you can't have other things. It has to be wheat, flour, and water. You have to have wine, and the wine must be made from grapes, so you can't have strawberry wine or dandelion wine or whatever. It must be made from grapes. Okay, so I don't think anybody's going to have a question about that. You have to have a validly ordained priest. Now, there are people who have questioned that. And if 
Father Eckert and Father Grabner and myself are not validly ordained, why would you be here? Because you'd be taking part in sacrilege. You'd be taking part in something that violates the first commandment because you'd be worshiping a piece of bread that didn't change into Jesus because you didn't have a real priest. And if the Novus Ordo Mass is invalid, and all three of us say the Novus Ordo Mass, that means that all three of us are in the state of sacrilege because we are offering something that is fake. And then we're coming here and we're saying this Mass in the state of sacrilege, which means that the Mass would still be valid, but you're taking part in a sacrilegious Mass. Do you really want to do that? You see, these things have consequences. To just let this roll off your tongue just sounds so easy. Oh, that's just invalid. Think of the consequences because this is really serious. Okay, so you have to have bread and wine. You have to have a validly ordained priest. The priest has to have the right intention. You have no control over whether the priest has the right intention or not. All you can do is assume if the priest shows up, he's, valid, he's properly vested and he has the right does things properly, that he probably had the right intention. Okay. So that brings it down to one thing, and this has got to be where people are claiming invalidity, and that is the form. That is the words that are used to be able to consecrate the bread and wine. So, always know you're in trouble if I have to bring something along, so I apologize for however long I might go on, but uh, here we are. This is the Summa Theologica from St. Thomas Aquinas. So we're going, not on my opinion, we're going to the source. And I brought it in in Latin, in case anyone wants to say, well, maybe the translation into English wasn't good. So here we go. So if you want to read the articles, it's in the third part of the Summa Theologica. Questions 73 to 83 is dealing with the Holy Eucharist. This is question 78. It's dealing with the form. And he goes through all these things. So first of all, this is Article 2, and this is the last line of the Respondio. So after he goes through all the points, he says simply this, Unde heg forma est convenientissima, hoc est corpus meum. Okay, wherefore, this form is the most appropriate. This is my body. Okay? In Article 3, this is also in the Respondio, he says, and this is a bit longer, Dicendum es ergo quod om omnia uh, precata uh, verba sunt de substantia formae, sed per prima verba uh, cum dicitur, hic es calic sanguis meis, significatur ipsit conversio vini in sanguinem, et modo quo dictum est in forma consecrationis panis, et verba autem consequentia de signatur virtus sanguis e fusi in passione, que operatur hoc in sacramento. So, therefore, it must be said that all these words, so in other words, the whole set of words of the consecration of the precious blood are this, of the substance of the form, but these words, these first words which are spoken, this is the chalice of my blood, signify, therefore, the conversion of the, of the wine into the blood according to the mode which you already said in the consecration of the bread. And the words, however, that follow designate the power of the blood that was shed in the Passion and is operative in the sacrament. So in other words, what is necessary for the consecration are the words, this is my body, this is the chalice of my blood. He takes up the question, I won't go into it, about the word anum because that's in there. So when we have mass in a few minutes, we will say hoc est anum corpus meum. Okay, St. Thomas said what's necessary is hoc est corpus meum. The anum is not necessary. He explains that whole thing. And then with the chalice, what follows, 
this is the chalice of my blood. What follows talks not about, it's not necessary for the consecration. It talks about the power of the blood of Jesus, which was shed. Okay? So, that said, Missale Romanum, the typical edition of the Novus Ordo Mass. Okay? We had a very unfortunate luminary at the seminary who tried to tell us that the Mass was written in English and then translated into Latin. Um, so, this is the typical edition in Latin. So I've got it all memorized, but I wanted to read it to you so that we're very clear. So as I mentioned a minute ago, in this Mass we will say, hoc est enim corpus meum. What does it say in the Novus Ordo? Hoc est enim corpus meum, quo provobis tradetur. Okay, so they added that little line at the end of it, which is given up for you. That doesn't change the fact of the validity because what is necessary are the words, this is my body. And then when it comes to the chalice, we will say, hic est enim calic sanguinis mei. What does it say in the Novus Ordo? Hic est enim calic sanguinis mei. Word for word, exactly the same. So therefore, everything necessary for validity is right there. Now you can say, I, I prefer this way, so do I. A preference isn't a problem. But to say that that's invalid is wrong. And we need to overcome that. And we can say, well, but it's not in Latin. May I remind you, first of all, there are 21 other rites in the Catholic Church. None of them use Latin. We are the Latin rite of the Catholic Church, therefore we would use Latin. We have three of those other rites in the Twin Cities, St. Constantine's, St. Marin's, actually in Holy Family, and St. John's. So one, two, well, we have two Maronite churches, those are the Lebanese people. We have St. Constantine's, which is the Ukrainian Catholics, and we have St. John's, which are the Ruthenian Catholics. They have Mass in their own language, as well as in English. They don't have it in Latin. And I may remind you also that at the Last Supper, Jesus spoke Aramaic, not Latin. And then it was translated from Aramaic into Greek. And then it was translated from Greek into Latin. So therefore, it didn't start this way. If you want the Aramaic, go over to the Maronite church because they still use the Aramaic exactly as Jesus used it. The church has given us Latin because that was the language of the empire and we're the Latin rite. So it makes perfect sense. But we can't say that because it's translated into a different language that that makes it invalid any more than we can say in any of the other 21 rites that don't use Latin that that's invalid. It's not. They're all completely valid. And we must understand that the fact that we come to this Mass doesn't automatically make us more Catholic or better Catholics than somebody else. Yeah, there are some people who are horrendous Catholics. There are people who don't believe a lot of what the Church teaches. They have put themselves outside the Catholic Church. But there are also people that go to the Novus Ordo Mass who are just as orthodox as you and me, who believe absolutely everything that the Church teaches. And you might say, well, then why aren't they going to this Mass? People have lots of reasons. But let me bring you to an extreme, because then it might give you a reason just to try to apply to somebody. I do this, for instance, when I'm out on the freeway and you see some nut coming up behind you doing this, you know, in and out, going almost 100 miles an hour. And, you know, I used to get so upset with them. And then one day I said to myself, you know what? 
maybe his wife is about to give birth and he's trying to get to the hospital. And if my wife was about to give birth, I'd be driving like that too. Now I know that 99% of the time that's not going to be the case, but it gives me an excuse. It gives me a way of saying, all right, just get out of the way. Maybe his wife is about to give birth. Don't just, just, just let him go. All right? So there is a person with whom I work. And this person was ritually, satanically, and sexually abused many times at a Tridentine Mass. Not a Tridentine Mass, at a number of Masses. Now, for those of you who think that everything was wonderful and perfect back in the 1950s and up into the early 60s, no, it wasn't, because that's when that person was violated at Mass by clergy. It's far from being perfect. And if you think that just by going to this Mass means that we aren't going to sin anymore, all I can do is point you to some of these unfortunate situations that have happened in traditionalist communities. They're having the same problems with pedophilia, with other things that are disgusting. I remember one priest, we'll just say he was orientationally challenged, shall we say, who looked at me one day and said, because he loved the old mass, said, where else could I go where I can dress up like a medieval prince? Like, really? It's not about God, it's about me looking like a prince. Give me a break. So yeah, just because you come to this Mass doesn't automatically make you somehow holier, better, or anything else. But this person that I was talking about wanted to be able to come to the Mass, but couldn't. They weren't able to come to this Mass because the fact is that it brought PTSD. It was very difficult for this person. I even just simply brought the 1965 Missal. That's the one where they started translating it into English. And they couldn't do it. So take an example like that and be able to apply it if somebody says, I can't go to that Mass. Again, 99% of the people, that's not going to be the case. But there are cases where that's the reality. So we can't make judgments. We have to accept. We have to respect. We have to strive for unity. The division is horrible. And especially when we are dividing Catholics against Catholics, it's not good. And that needs to stop. So we need to be able to recognize Yes, I think this Mass is the better Mass. But that doesn't make the other one invalid. And we need to quit telling people that it is. Because we have to again recognize we don't get more of Jesus at this Mass. If the Mass is valid, Jesus is present. So you get the exact same Jesus in the Eucharist here as they do there. No difference. You don't get more of Jesus. He's either present or he's not. The Mass is either valid or it's not. So if you get more of Jesus, there's a problem because what we're saying is Jesus isn't fully present. He's kind of present there. You can't say that. No, Jesus is fully present or he's not present at all. So what surrounds the consecration yeah, there's more grace in the prayers and all the different things that happen, so there may be more grace that is available at this Mass. But Jesus isn't more present in the Eucharist at this Mass than he is at the other. It's the same Jesus. And either he's present or he's not. So again, understand the consequences of this. If this is what we're going to say, we've got some serious issues that we need to look at. And you need to ask yourself very seriously, 
If these priests are in the state of sacrilege, or if they're not validly ordained, or if the Mass is invalid, should I even be going there? Why would you? It doesn't make sense. So think about that. Because this is really, really serious. And it's sad to think that we have Catholics dividing Catholics. It's one thing if the government's going to divide us. It's another if we've got all these other factors trying to divide us. But we need to be united. We're all in this together. And so if there are people of the same faith, don't divide them. Unite them. Respect the brotherhood. Bring about unity, not division, so that all of us together can serve Jesus with one heart.